you ever experienced a moment in your life that grows to become something far greater than you ever imagined it could be at the time? I don't know how many couples I've spoken to who tell of what seemed to be a chance meeting that ends up in marriage. She was a friend of a friend who at the last minute tagged along to the movies. He was a soldier who happened to be based in a camp near town. And yet those, those moments, those times, are looked on with the wonder and thrill that only hindsight can bring. Imagine that. It was just a chance thing and then it became everything. A moment that takes on far greater significance than you ever realised at the time. Or perhaps it was that impulsive decision to go to church that day or to go on that camp that meant that you were saved. I wonder if Simpson, with his trusty donkey Gallipoli, ever dreamed that his service would become an icon not only of the Australian soldier but of the Australian spirit. There's all kinds of things that happen just at the time that become so significant later on. I'm pretty sure that Jonah had no idea that in the plans of God, his experience would later become a symbol of the experience of the Lord Jesus himself. We've been going through the book of Jonah. We finished the book itself last week and we saw how it finished with a question that God asked Jonah. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And we never got to hear Jonah's answer. We're left to supply our own answer to that. How do we respond to God's compassion for the whole world? Maybe it's probably better that we didn't hear Jonah's answer because if he's uh, anything like he was in the rest of the chapter, it wouldn't have been a very nice answer. He was in the middle of his second temper tantrum in the space of one chapter and I'm not sure if he ever got over that. So much of Jonah's story we learned was about how not to have a relationship with God. He's like that dad in the Berenstein Bears books that I used to read to the kids. And I felt pretty bad as a dad reading it because every time the dad got it wrong. That's Jonah. Everything he did, he seemed to get it wrong. But somehow God in his goodness turned things around and was perfectly able to make the life of a disobedient, petulant, whinging, hypocritical, reluctant prophet significant in salvation history. In some amazing way, Jonah, as bad as he was, points us to Jesus. And if he can do it with Jonah, he can do it with you and I. Let's see how he does it. We read from Jonah, chap- uh, Jonah from Matthew chapter 12 uh, earlier on. And before our reading, uh, Jesus has been having an amazing ministry. He's healed the sick. He's driven out demons. He's cured lepers, the blind, the deaf. He's calmed the storm. He's raised the dead. He's preached the good news of the kingdom To all people. And in chapter 12, verse 23, his healing of a demon possessed person who couldn't speak and was deaf prompted people who were watching to ask, Could this be the son of David? With all these miracles, serious questions were being asked Is Jesus the one the law and the prophets pointed towards? Is he the promised Messiah we've been waiting for for thousands of years? As that talk's going on, the leaders of the people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't like that kind of talk. And so they dismiss Jesus. It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow's able to drive out demons. Can you imagine what what they're saying there? All those things that Jesus is doing can only be empowered by Satan. Jesus calls them up on this and gives them a stern warning about attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil. They're hard words and they sting the Pharisees. So they want to get Jesus to back his words up. So in chapter 12, verse 38, they said, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. That sounds nice and polite and maybe even reasonable. Jesus, if you're saying these things, will show us your authority to say them. But really, that that request hides their opposition to him. A sign in this context is a miraculous confirmation of the speaker's authority. They want Jesus to be able to prove through some miracle that he has the authority to tell them off. Maybe they want God's voice from heaven confirming Jesus. Just like at his baptism in chapter 3. Or maybe they want some special display of God's power 
apart from all the healings and exorcism and calming the storm, you know, what more could they be asking from Jesus? No, what this polite question implies is they're not going to believe Jesus no matter what he does. They were sure that Jesus couldn't deliver and so they wanted to force his hand here so they could put an end to all this Messiah talk. It's an insolent question. They've refused to believe all the other miracles and now they're demanding another one. It's as though they're saying, Jesus, you've got to jump through our hoops or we're not going to believe in you at all. That request is an indication of their confirmed unbelief, their stubbornness in face of everything that Jesus has said so far and done. It's like some atheists who I've met or I've seen on TV who demand, if God is real, let him strike me down by lightning now. And then they laugh when it doesn't happen. It's proof then that God doesn't exist because he didn't do it. I instinctively step back from them when they say that because I can't help but wondering if one day God might call that bluff. But it also strikes me, excuse the pun, that even if they were struck by lightning, apart from being dead, they say oh, that was just bad luck or a coincidence. People just do not want to believe regardless of the signs. Questions and demands like the Pharisees come from a heart that refuses to believe. And Jesus sees right through it. Verse 39 of Matthew 12 says, Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus gets stuck right in, calling them a wicked and adulterous generation. And he doesn't mean adulterous in the normal sense of the word, but adulterous towards God. Meant to be faithful towards him, to trust him only, but that's not what they're doing. It's a common image in the Old Testament to refer to the people of Israel's abandonment of God for other idols as adultery. Jeremiah records God's words in chapter 3 of his book that says, Have you seen what faithful Israel has done? She's gone up on every high hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. They were sent into exile as punishment for that adultery, spiritual adultery. The exile cured them of following other gods, but their hearts were still far from God. And even here, Jesus is saying, your hearts are still far from God. So far, in fact, the majority of the people in Jesus' day didn't even recognize God when he came to them. John would write in his gospel, he came to that which was his own, and his own didn't receive him. So Jesus here refuses to give them a sign. Now, we've also seen in the Bible it's not wrong to ask for a sign in and of itself. Think of Gideon in the book of Judges where he was so, he just needed a sign repeatedly from God to give him the courage to do what God had asked him to do. God patiently gave him those signs. King Hezekiah was offered a sign without him even asking for one. So asking for a sign in itself is not wrong when it comes from weak faith. But here, there's no faith at all. It reminds me of the Pharisees at Jesus' crucifixion. They're still going at it. In the end of Matthew, in Matthew 27, they say, oh, he saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. Do you think that if that happened, that they would? No. That statement is an evidence of a refusal to believe. The only reason they said it was because they didn't think he could. And so facing that kind of insolent and hard-hearted unbelief, Jesus refuses to give them a sign. Not only would it be wasted, but Jesus consistently refused to do something on demand of people just who wanted to be entertained. And yet, in his refusal, he does give them a sign. And that's where our friend Jonah comes in. Have a look at verses 39 and 40 of Matthew 12. The Pharisees demanded a sign that would immediately vindicate Jesus' words. And so he gives them a sign that's in a sense no sign at all. Far from clarifying his words, this would have baffled the Pharisees. We read that other similar situation in the temple itself in John 2. Jesus just uh, driven out the money changers, cleared out the temple. And in verse 18, John writes, When the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple 
and I'll raise it again in three days. The, the, the reply of the Jewish leaders showed that they had no idea what he was talking about. They thought he was talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body. John said it even left the disciples scratching their heads until after the resurrection. And so Jesus uses two images on two different occasions, Jonah and the temple, but the meaning's the same. He says very clearly before it happens that he will be dead three days and will rise again. In Matthew, he uses that image of Jonah in the belly of the fish. And the similarities are there. Jonah entombed in the belly of the fish for three days. Jesus entombed in the earth for three days. Both preached a message of repentance. Jonah to the Ninevites, Jesus to everyone. But that's where the similarities fade. Jonah in the fish was as good as dead. He was in a living kind of death. But Jesus actually died. Confronted with the empty tomb, those still unbelieving Pharisees concocted a story about the disciples stealing the body. You know, they, were no, they were under no illusion that Jesus hadn't died. It was obvious to everyone there, to his friends and his enemies, who witnessed the event that Jesus was definitely dead. Their problem was the resurrection. He told them years ahead of time that three days after he would die, he would rise, he'd rise again. I don't know if those words came back to haunt the Pharisees, but there's the sign just as he gave it to them. A sign for all those who have eyes to see. But the blindness of unbelief prevented them from seeing that sign. would rather make up stories than to be confronted by the reality. Paul comments in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Jewish people demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Jewish people demanded a sign but missed the reality. And Jesus, through this picture of Jonah in the temple, challenges his, his hearers just as he challenges you and I. Where do you stand today? If you haven't turned to Jesus in repentance, what's holding you back? Maybe you're waiting on some more proof, something that will convince you of, of God's reality or, or of Jesus' uh, claims. So, And if that's the case, I'd like to ask you then, following from what we've seen from what Jesus said, what more do you need? What more evidence will convince you? Everything about Jesus is, is clearly set before us in the Bible. We have the testimony of eyewitnesses. Towards the end of his gospel, John writes, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John and the others wrote to present the life of Jesus, so that as you read that, you would be able to believe. All the evidence necessary to prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be is right there for us. We have to ask ourselves, what more do we need? We have to be so careful that our desire for something more, maybe not so much coming from a questioning heart or intellectual curiosity, but may be a symptom of a refusal to believe. What's recorded here in the Gospels, Jesus' testimony here, recorded by reliable eyewitnesses, is enough to provide the evidence and the basis for faith. And please don't harden your heart to it. We see the Pharisees refusing, even with all the evidence right in front of them. We don't want to be guilty of that. But the other similarity Jesus draws with Jonah is in their preaching. In chapter 12 of Matthew, in verse 41, we read, The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. Now that comparison must have hurt his hearers. The men of Nineveh will be able to stand and condemn Jesus' contemporaries because they repented at Jonah's preaching when this lot wouldn't even listen to Jesus. The Pharisees would have known that the men of Nineveh were ignorant and violent, 
And they were Gentiles, they were outside the community of faith, and yet they responded with wholehearted repentance after only one day of a very reluctant preach, uh, preacher, a good-for-nothing prophet. And so perhaps Jesus is being ironic when he says something greater than Jonah is here. You know, could there be anyone worse than Jonah? Someone who did not want to be able to share that good news? Someone who wasn't interested in those people being saved? Yet the Ninevites responded to that. And Jesus is saying now one infinitely greater than Jonah has come amongst them and their demand for a sign gives away their hard-hearted refusal to believe. They will not listen to him and that, that, that generation stood condemned because of that. They were, got to hear the words of Jesus. Well, our generation has no excuse either. We have the words of Jesus right here, and yet the people of Nineveh could stand and condemn us for our refusal to hear Jesus' words. We hear the warning in what Jesus is saying here in his comparison with Jonah. But also... Let what Jesus says uh, encourage you. You know, who'd have thought it? Jonah. Out of all the prophets that Jesus compares himself to, it's not Isaiah or Ezekiel or Daniel or one of the great ones. It's Jonah. He's the worst of the lot. Now, I've been hard on Jonah. And part of the reason is because I see too much of me in him. But God in his grace used Jonah. And so that encourages me that God can even use me. Jonah, as imperfect and weak as he was, was used in the plan of God to point people to Jesus. And his significance only became fully known many, many years after his death. Who'd have thought that that experience in the fish would be used by Jesus as a testimony to his death and resurrection? Sometimes as we go about our, our walk and work for Jesus, it's easy to become focused on the things that we do wrong. I can cut myself up repeatedly about the things I should have said or the things I shouldn't have said, the opportunities that are missed, the things that could have been done better. Or maybe perhaps you're just slogging away and it's, it's just hard work following Jesus. And you don't see a whole lot of fruit for that. Or maybe as you serve others in Jesus' name, you don't see a whole lot of response to that. Perhaps you're wondering what you're doing wrong. But if Jonah's going to encourage us, it encourages us to see that the full significance of our life and ministry might not be known for many years. There was a woman in our previous church who prayed for her non-Christian husband for decades. And she was a, a lovely lady. You could just see Jesus in her. She was an obvious witness. She had a, lived a godly life and he absolutely refused to believe in Jesus and made her life really hard because she did. And she didn't live to see her prayers answered. Do you know the Sunday after her funeral, he comes to church. The first time I'd ever seen him. And at his funeral, a year later, his son told about his dad coming to Jesus only a matter of weeks before his death. Her prayers for decades, she didn't get to see this side of heaven, but now they're reunited in heaven. Eternity reveals the full extent of her ministry. I know that scripture teachers slog away sometimes, and that can be really difficult work. And the fruit of their work mightn't become apparent until after the students leave school. Again, at my older church, a friend of mine, she died not so long ago. She was a Sunday school teacher for decades as well. And she told me of a girl who was in Sunday school years and years ago, but it's only now as a grown woman with her own children, she wrote a letter to the Sunday school and said, thank you for teaching me about Jesus. But she's now following Jesus and teaching her children too. You know, we mightn't realise our significance in the God's plan of salvation. And sometimes we might feel a bit like Jonah, just, just ineffective or just grumpy about it. We're finding it hard. But unfaithful, disobedient Jonah calls us to be faithful and obedient to Jesus' call. Our role in God's plan might become only known in eternity. But in our weakness, we're called to point others to Jesus through our lives. And who knows what God's going to do with that? 
How about I pray and commit us to him in that? Father, we thank you for the way that the Lord Jesus takes up Jonah and uses him as a a picture of his coming death and resurrection. We thank you for the way that you were so patient with Jonah uh, throughout that book, uh, gently drawing him back to you. And then you gave him a wonderful job of being able to proclaim that message to the people of Nineveh who repented and then gave even his experience uh, that, that is significance that, uh, that points to Jesus. Father, often in our lives we feel like we wonder what we're doing and we're very uh, aware of what we do wrong. But we thank you that you are very patient with us and that you uh, give the opportunities for us to share about you and to pray for others and to be able to serve others. And even though we might not see the whole outcome of that in our own life, we thank you that you have all these things in good plan, that you will know what to do and that you will use even us uh, to affect the lives of others, to point people to you. Lord, we want to be people who uh, point you people to Jesus uh, for all the right ways, unlike Jonah. But Lord, we thank you too for those who have died trusting in Jesus, that their work is finished and that we still uh, enjoy the blessings that they brought into our lives. Father, even this week, may we be able to point people to Jesus in our words, in our actions, in the way we conduct ourselves, in such a way that it would be useful to you, and that others might have that same joy of being able to know and trust the Lord Jesus. Father, if, if there's something in our hearts, like Jonah, that just did not want to do your will, or even worse, like the Pharisees, where we just don't want to believe. Father, may you deal gently with us and uh, that those doubts and disbelief might uh, be melted away before the, the evidence and the reality of Jesus and who he is. And we pray it all in his name. Amen.